Hi everyone, my name is Yurai Tanaka. I will be presenting my work that I did in collaboration with Alan Shen, Andy Kohn, and my advisor Pedro Lopez at the University of Chicago. Here, the user is in a VR climbing simulator, feeding realistic haptics through the actual rope serving as a prop. Now, they hold the virtual climbing hold and feel its haptics on their palm. Let's hold on a second and make sure you all see that this person's palm is completely free. But somehow, they are able to feel the haptics of the hold. Before revealing the trick, let me introduce the motivation behind this. In the past decades, researchers in the haptics community have been oriented to making these haptics gloves that allow you to feel the virtual world by a touch and sometimes force. These devices are great, but I think we've come in the wrong direction. Let me explain why. For today's interactive experiences, users no longer purely interact with the virtual world. Mixed reality is a good example. Here, the user who fixes an engine should be able to feel haptics of the virtual interfaces, but most importantly, they must be able to feel the haptics of the engine itself. So we cannot let the user wear a haptic rope and stop feeling the physical world. Even in VR, when we look at the, its practical use, many VR training applications incorporate physical props into their experience to make the training more realistic. So here, keeping the user's hands free is critical to ensure the quality of the training. There have been some attempts to engineer haptic devices that keep users feeling the real world. One example is using a foldable actuator, which was proposed by Shang Yun Tang from our lab. Here, the haptic actuator covers up the user's skin only when the virtual haptics comes in, and freeing up the user's skin otherwise. However, this type of actuator involves latency in switching between the two states, and feedback is only available while the finger is in mid-air. Another approach is using thin actuators. So while the user feels the virtual feedback by the device, they can still feel some textures of physical objects through the device. However, the same research group found that thin films like this still impair the user's tactile acuity. So here's my radical proposal. Can we make the user's palmer side completely free, meaning attaching no thin films or actuators on the side of the palm, while causing multiple tactile sensations in the palm? To achieve this, we apply electrical stimulation by electrodes attached to the back of the hand. But wait for a second. If we put electrodes on the back, then we should feel on the back and not on the front, right? Let me show you why this works. First of all, let me clarify that the nerves responsible for sensing touch extend all the way from our hands to our brains. So in theory, it is possible to elicit touch sensations by intercepting appropriate nerve at the middle of the path. For instance, by the armpit, the elbow, or the wrist. Okay, this is great. I just told you we can intercept the nerves from far away with electricity. Let's try it and apply the stimulation here in the middle of the arm to stimulate the finger part of the index finger. Let's see what happens. Oops, it created a sensation in the whole palm, not on that individual finger. This is a challenge. But notice that there is something interesting happening after the wrist. The nerves came as a bundle, but spread out after the wrist. So what if we stimulate after the wrist? This is why we attach electrodes to the back of the hand, so we can stimulate individual fingers. Now, when I say back of the hand, you can imagine a naive placement like this, where two electrodes are side by side. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for creating sensations in the palm because the electrical currents only reach the nerves on the back side. However, currents can reach deeper regions by, by increasing the distance between electrodes. So you can see where this electrode is going. 
By having this electrode here, very far from the other one, we can stimulate the nerves that innervate the front side of the finger as well. Okay, so we stimulate after the wrist and we push the current deeper to reach also the receptors that innervate the front. But wait, doesn't the current still stimulate both receptors on the front and back? Well, here's the interesting part. We have 60 times more receptors on the front than the back, making the front side much more sensitive to electrical currents. This means if I increase the current in small amounts, the first side that, that will feel a tactile sensation is the front side. Because it has more receptors and the lower sensitivity threshold, this is our approach. This sounds great for one location, but when we extend to multiple finger segments, we notice that stimulation is felt between the erectors. This means no sensation arises at the finger part. But of course, we cannot leave the finger part unstimulated. So this is what we do. While we apply positive electrical currents to other parts, we flip the polarity and apply negative currents from this electrode. The key principle is that the negative current advances the location of the stimulated receptors in the fingertip direction. In this way, we can cause touch sensation at the finger part. By combining all the solutions described so far, this is how we render tactile sensations in this rock climbing experience with this final electrode arrangement, while keeping the user's palm completely free. As we can stimulate two parts on each finger and the palm, the user feels haptics at the precise locations where their hands are actually touching the virtual climbing holes. Now let's see how accurate our technique is. We asked 10 participants to report which part of the hand they felt the stimulation. First of all, as you can see, over 90% of the sensations were felt in the palmar side of the hand. Moreover, the standard deviations of the locations of the perceived stimulations also show that our technique creates sensations at the 11 points on the palmar side of the hand that are spatially well separated. Our approach of keeping the user's palmar side completely free allows more applications that were not possible before. One example is supporting users' physical model making in mixed reality. The user wants to make a physical copy of this virtual bear. As they are grabbing it, our device presents the shape of the bear through tactile feedback. Now the user started modeling and they can dexterously manipulate knead and squeeze the cray mode without interference from our device. Moreover, our device can render tactile feedback of the virtual bear even while the user is physically touching the cray model, so they can feel the alignment between the virtual and physical models. We can also use our technique to add tactile notifications during highly dexterous activities such as DJing. As you can see, the DJ is skillfully manipulating the knobs or the faders of the mixer with wearing our device. The user can also feel the virtual marking on the turntable rendered by our stimulation, guiding them on how to mix the track effectively. So to conclude, today I proposed an alternative to the mainstream haptic devices that prevent the user from feeling the physical world. Our technique renders tactile feedback in multiple parts of the palm while keeping it completely free, preserving the user's tactile acuity and manual dexterity during interactions with physical objects. The key here is to intercept the user's nervous system rather than attaching actuators at the end point. In fact, that's what I'm delving into for my PhD. In my Kyle paper from last year, I also proposed intercepting the user's neck muscles to actuate the head, rather than using an exoskeleton attached to the head to mechanical, mechanically move it. So I'd like to thank my collaborators again, first my colleague Aran and Andy, and my advisor Pedro. Thank you for your listening.